Uh, apologies for our absence. Um, hi, Chair. Yes, we have apologies from Councillor Duggins, Councillor Slay. Apologies from Henrietta Brealey, Sue Abitson, Vanessa Jardine, Catherine Mangan, and Jatinda Sharma, and David Melbourne. Okay, thank you. Sorry, could I also say, um, I'm Georgie Hancock, I'm from the um, the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner. Just apologies from Jonathan Jardine and Alethea Fuller, and um, they wanted to be here, but um, they couldn't, so they sent me instead. You're welcome to the meeting, Georgie. So Thank no problem. You. Can that apology be noted as well, please? Okay, any declarations of interest? Um, I'd just like to remind members that members are reminded uh, of the need to declare uh, any disclosable pecuniary interests they have in an item being discussed during the course of the meeting. In addition, the receipt of any gift or hospitality should be declared where the value is thought to have exceeded £25 uh, for gifts and £40 for hospitality. Any members to declare any interest? No. Okay. Okay, next uh, is the Chair's remarks. So, today's meeting. Uh, is a formal board meeting and uh, there are no decisions to be made today and uh, what we agreed is that if there are any decisions to be made then we'll have to meet in person but we're not making any decision today so it can be online meeting as well um anything other than that so this meeting uh, is mainly about receiving updates on topics from officers, whole discussions. Members can express their opinions, but we can't make any decisions. Um, also, in terms of reference, so I've, uh, in, even in the first meeting, I've encouraged members who are not part of the board to uh, attend for their self-development if they are interested. So if you can uh, encourage anybody who you know can benefit from attending this meeting, please encourage them to come and join us at our next meeting. I'll do that personally in, the, in case of Sanval. Um, I will have conversation with a few new councillors who would love this opportunity to attend this meeting. Okay, next one I've got is minutes of the last meeting. Now my note says that you know uh, the last board meeting minutes have already been agreed and seconded. Is that the case, Ed? Okay, so we just need to agree or note the minutes from the informal meeting in July. Can that be seconded? Can any member second the minutes presented? from the informal meeting in July. That needs Laura? To be a formal person, yeah. Thank you, Laura. So is that agreed? OK, silence. I'll take that as approval. Right, thank you. The minutes from the July meeting being agreed. Uh, matters arising. I have not received any uh, matters arising from the minutes so far, so I believe there isn't any. Okay, right, let's move on to the items on the agenda. And the first one I've got is PSR comms, fairer, greener and healthier publication. And uh, I believe Ed Cox, you're presenting this? Yes, I am. Thanks, Councillor Singh. And um, uh, welcome, everybody. Um, um, so the first thing to say is um, I hope everybody has uh, received, if they've not been able to read in its entirety, um, a report that was sent round yesterday um, uh, afternoon, um, which is our working together to create a fairer, greener, healthier West Midlands document. I've got uh, one printed copy here. Uh, I ought to say um, at the very 
beginning that um, this is still a draft document, um, but we wanted to bring it to the informal board meeting today in case people have comments or concerns or questions so that we can um, really knock it into final shape and then circulate it um, with with a wide range of stakeholders actually um, once once it's uh, it's fully completed. So I'm looking forward to comments that people might have about it um, today. Um, the second thing to say is that um, effectively it was commissioned by Councillor Singh um, as he came into role as portfolio lead and chair of the Public Service Reform and Inclusive Growth Board. Um, and um, one of his questions uh, when taking on the role was, so what is the, if you like, cumulative impact of all of the work that we are doing in the name of this board? Um, and I think it was a timely challenge to us all um, to really think about so what is it that uh, that you know all of our work adds up to uh, and so um, there's been a lot of work that's taken place over the past month or so uh, in gathering that together and putting it together in a format that really demonstrates that impact and I hope that people who have had the time to read it will uh, recognize um, that there actually is a huge amount of work that goes on uh, within my directorate uh, and that it is having significant impact on a very wide range of topics. Um, we've um, called it fairer, greener and healthier because um, it covers, we felt that it would be good to cover the whole um, of the directorate's activity. Uh, so public service reform and inclusive growth, but also um, the work we do around energy and the environment and indeed um, uh, uh, health and well-being as well. So you'll see um, three um, sort of substantive sections in the report, uh, one on fairer, which is the bit that covers um, this board, uh, one on greener, which covers energy environment, and one on healthier, which covers um, well-being and health. But I hope people will see um, that there's uh, a lot of synergy between the different sections and that it holds together really as a uh, substantive uh, report with connections being made across those three themes. We've tried to spell out the impact of the different uh, programmes and projects of work uh, within the report. Um, and in some sections, in many sections, what we've tried to do is highlight what we've called the kind of human impact. Uh, so the numbers of lives that have been touched by or the different ways in which we have uh, transform things on the ground, so to speak. Uh, we've also um, talked about funding successes uh, and tried to demonstrate uh, the extent to which um, uh, we've levered in investment into the region in order to address some of those fairer, greener and healthier um, issues and concerns that we've that we've we've got. Um, and I think um, the kind of figure that stands out to me is that um, for approximately two million pounds worth of investment each year uh, we've managed to generate about 70 million pounds worth of um, uh, investment into uh, the region um, over the past um, 18 months or so so uh, we feel that's uh, incredibly good uh, value for money if that's the way in which we're trying to judge these things uh, but in in each of the different sections uh, you'll see the different funding successes and the uh, extent to which um, we've 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 leveraged in funding uh, for the work that we're doing. Um, and then also um, in each section, we've identified policy impact as well. Uh, and I don't think we should, um, uh, if you like, um, overlook the importance of the ways in which we uh, have been uh, working with partners uh, in order to transform policy, whether that's at the local level or indeed in some cases at the national level as well. Um, so uh, that's a really, really important uh, element to, to the report is the way in which we actually present that, um, that impact. Um, I want to um, mention in particular uh, that we've done our best throughout the report to um, describe and highlight the way in which we've worked um, very closely in partnership with lots of other people. I think it's um, really fundamental to uh, the way in which our directorate works, which is that uh, we don't uh, simply work as a small team of uh, officers within the combined authority, but in actual fact we work within extended teams in local authorities um, with the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner, with 
um, voluntary and community organisations, third sector organisations, social enterprises, um, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So we hope that in the report we reflect the fact that almost every single programme that we work on is done in partnership. And the other thing we've tried to do in the report to that um, extent is to highlight where we um, have made specific contributions in specific places and indeed in particular uh, local authorities. So on pages 28 and 29, for example, uh, we've actually done our best to pull out uh, some of the activities, by no means uh, comprehensive, but some of the activity that has taken place um, in each of the different constituent local authorities um, in, in the combined authority. And then the last thing uh, I want to say by way of uh, presenting the report um, is just in one of the early sections um, we talk about um, social innovation. Uh, we've got a whole um, item on this agenda, um, uh, on the, ne the next item in fact on this agenda about what we mean by social innovation uh, and how that, uh, how that works in relation to public service reform. Um, but there's a short section in the report um, really which explains uh, what I'm going to be talking about later on today uh, and how we're trying to understand public service reform in the context of a wider understanding and appreciation of social innovation. And in particular on pages eight and nine, um, we have set out what we're describing as a social innovation offer. Again, I'm going to come back and say some more about that in the next item on the agenda, but I wanted to draw people's attention to the fact that this document not only is a, an impact report, if you like, about the work of the directorate, um, but it's also an invitation to future partnership working between ourselves um, and um, other partners um, across the combined authority. So Councillor Singh, I think that's all I've got to say by way of introduction to the report, but I'd be very happy to take comments and questions. And as I say, um, at the moment, the report is still um, in many respects a draft, so um, we can make uh, some changes if we need to uh, in the uh, week ahead. Thank you, Ed, that was a really good introduction. and. Uh, Personally, I think it, it's a really uh, good initiative by the board. Uh, what we're trying to achieve here is change the perception of how people see our intervention, because this is not just about uh, transforming things that are already in transition, but it is about providing that support, uh, which we want to do. And I think this, this board can really contribute in terms of uh, you know how we have changed since pandemic and how we need to adapt to the new way of life and this report provides very good clarity about uh, what we want to achieve and uh, what are the challenges uh, things like you know uh, uh, digital inclusion so this is something which was not a big thing pre-pandemic but during the pandemic we realized that you know uh, not everybody is you know, uh, achieving uh, success or moving forward at the same pace that we would expect. So there's a huge gap that we need to address and how we're going to bring those uh, people on board uh, who are not privileged in terms of all that information that that's out there. And fortunately, we, we West Midland, we are test bed for 5G. So it's a really good opportunity to use that uh, opportunity to bring our uh, some of the communities on board and inclusive growth and inclusive communities. This, this, this is something which we need to, you know, uh, spread across the board. Every thing comes to inclusive growth because every other other portfolio will have to contribute if we want to achieve inclusive growth and, uh, you know, we want to bring all communities on board. And we have realized that, you know, it, together we can achieve a lot more by working in silos. We are we are really exhausting our resources to to gain same outcomes. But coming together, we can really have a huge greater impact in terms of achieving those objectives. So I'll, I'll pause here and I'm happy to take questions. I've got one hand up, uh, Isabel. Hi, hello. Um, thank you very much. Sorry, I was late in coming in. I think you've got my um, 
hanging on to another one. But I did want to just talk on this report uh, because it, it very much has the ability of cross cutting as you've already uh, um, identified. And and in my um, board, which is the wellbeing board, um, actually one of the key uh, opportunities for us is to lift people's life opportunities and not only lift their opportunities, but increase their well-being, their mental health and their life outcomes. Um, so there's a very positive um, cross uh, section across the boards and particularly the one that we're trying to do and the work that we looked at um, as, as the impact of COVID and how um, it had really impacted a lot harder on people who had uh, poor opportunities in life uh, you know this I think addresses how we move away from that should there be any other situation similar to that god forbid but um so i think it you know i think we should uh, welcome it and and thank ed and the team for the work that they've put into this and uh, certainly i'd be happy to um, endorse this and support it thank you very much as well uh, and yes as i completely agree this is a cross uh, and, and and a multi agency approach uh, that we're trying to adapt, and this is the the the, the future. I think this is the only way uh, we can move forward together. So thank you very much for that endorsement. Uh, my screen is frozen for some reason, but I can see Georgie's uh, hand up. So I'll ask Georgie to come in, and then I'll have to log out and log in back. That's all right. Thank Georgie. you. Um, yeah, I've been asked to come um, and feedback a couple of concerns that were had from um, our office. Um, I believe an email has been sent from our chief exec, Jonathan, and um, I think it was over lunchtime, so apologies if this is the first time the concerns have been raised. Um, but there are a couple of concerns. Um, so one, we, I don't think, we've not got any kind of record of us signing off on the section that relates to our office. Um, and because of this, um, it puts some of the projects at risk. So some of the projects listed um, haven't had their funding confirmed yet. Um, so at this stage, we can't really publish or have that. I appreciate it's a draft document, um, but we can't have those um, printed yet because the, the funding's not confirmed yet with other partners. Um, and then the other main concern was around the portrayal of the role that the Combined Authority played in some of the history of um, pro projects or processes uh, within the OPCC. So one of the ones that was flagged to me was the history of the VRU. Um, so apologies for kind of bringing those just now, um, but they were the concerns that have been um, relayed over to me. Um, and I'm sure Jonathan um, and or Alethea can have a conversation with more detail outside of this meeting if that's helpful. Um, but I wanted to flag those two main concerns at this stage. Okay, um, well, thanks for that. Georgie, certainly um, let's have a conversation with Jonathan about those those details. Um, and yeah, you know, there's there's no there's no intention here at all uh, of causing any problems, in, especially in relation to bringing in further funding or anything like that. So uh, yeah, cool. let's let's have that. Let's have that further conversation and get those details um, absolutely right. Brilliant. I'll feed that back to Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you. Ed. Um, I'm really sorry. My 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 screen is completely frozen. Uh, can you still hear me? Yes, we can. Chair, would right. you like me just to carry on with this item whilst you log out and log back in again? Please, please be... yeah, I'm trying to log out, which I'm struggling, but uh, please carry on, Ned. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, so I think, Gary, you've got your hand up as well. Yeah, thanks very much, Ed. Uh, so first of all, uh, you know, I wasn't at the last meeting, so uh, I sort of want to compliment yourself and Claire and all the other sort of architects of the report. I, I think it's a you know a really good exercise of bringing it all together at a, at a really you know opportune time having been around you know total place and community based budgets and all the other iterations and the previous sort of uh, attempts around PSR I think what you've done by reframing around social innovation and broader sustainability and the, the sort of three blocks you've described there is excellent and you know will give it the best platform for success so you know we're in a good place and i think the report really you know helps others understand where we are and, and the specific examples so you know uh, just you know real compliments for that um it's also good having in council seekham on here as well as chair of the health and well-being board as well because my comments relate to the the health element of it 
Okay. And I can see that you've um, you've picked up there around the benefits of uh, learning from COVID and what was a, obviously a really challenging and difficult period for everyone, but some of the opportunities and some of the positives have come out of that. So my sort of comment relates to, I mean, on page 25 of the report, it specifically mentions uh, or references the, the health of the, the region report and talks around the, the tackling wider health determinants. So as well as the health and wellbeing board, there's also another key stakeholder where many of the attendees of this uh, this board will be sort of uh, represented on there, which is a local resilience forum. They led a lot of the sort of practical, uh, tactical sort of uh, responses to uh, COVID. And they, uh, you know, that they, they le we learned as we went um, and we've done a structured sort of debrief as well, um, along with sort of Warwickshire uh, um, sort of CCG. Uh, I think it was commissioned to, um, I think it was commissioned to either Warwickshire or Coventry University. So it's like a, an independent academic piece where there's some real key learning and some great examples of sort of case studies and existing relationships um, and sort of partnership approaches, which could really feed into what you're doing there, Ed. Um, and in terms of, you know, breaking, you know, breaking down the sort of barriers um, and the difficulties and the bureaucracy and some of the relationships and the politics and egos that stop us getting together. COVID has sort of removed those out of the way. It would be a crying shame if we didn't now sort of hold on to those relationships that have been developed through there. So, I mean, talk about, the, you know, my role in the fire service. We've been involved in, you know, a range of things around health, well-being, social care, which are almost like, you know, public sector reform, you know, within an emergency crisis but let's not not lose the ground that we've made there. So I really think building on that health um, sort of um, pillar that you've created there, working with Easy, Easy's group as well. Um, and I know a lot of them are represented on here. I know I'm not sure which representatives are on the call today, but I really think there's an opportunity to probably potentially enhance that, uh, enhance that as well um, and build on it further with uh, alongside Easy's group and also the, uh, you know, the partners from the local resilience forum. So hopefully that's helpful, Head, and you know, that's really helpful, we, we'd, be, we'd, we'd be really keen to be involved in that as well, sort of as you know, the, as the catalyst that we provided before. Definitely, thank you, Gary. That's absolutely great, and I think you know one of the things that we'd be really keen to do. And again, I'm I'm slightly sort of edging into the next item on the agenda is to sit down with colleagues like yourself with the local resilience forum and to explore what does this social innovation offer mean in that context and how can we work together um to to you know to, to to really build on what the impact that's set out in that report so that we can move into a kind of the next phase the next couple of years um with that with that fresh social innovation approach so very happy to to do that um, yeah yeah and as a, as a specific reference document i know that debrief report that academic research yeah, uh, almost like a learnings that that's that's going to be released in the next week so uh yeah that'd be a really useful source document for you to supplement what you've got thank you that sounds fantastic i don't know if councillor sitting is um is, oh, is yeah. yeah i i, I was going i was going to say possibly um that might be something that we could usefully look at at the next psr board meeting you know um the learning that's that's coming out of of uh, from, from the local resilience forum absolutely i think i think it's it's vital that uh, uh, yes we have that on board as a, as as we are moving in terms of uh, uh this report so i I'm, I'm i'm happy for that to be taken on board next meeting if that's all right and uh, I would, if there's no further questions from anyone, I would like to uh, say that uh, this is this is really a good initiative. I'm really pleased with the direction we have adopted in terms of focusing our resources uh, to achieve some of the. Uh, how, how I put it is, this is our local version of leveling up. Um, yeah. And and I think I think there is a great need for. Uh, addressing these issues locally because uh, yes, national government is is talking about uh, leveling up, and uh, they've even changed the name of the 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 department to department yep. of leveling up. But sometimes leveling up cannot be addressed from the top because leveling up is something that's grounded locally, and I think local governments have better knowledge about where. Uh, resources needs to be focused if it if if we really want to achieve um, 
uh, you know some results in terms of leveling up and uh, this this is a good, good initiative uh, from this board and uh, really look forward to uh, how we proceed with this and uh, thank you Ed, for this fantastic uh, draft report thank you Captain Singh. and if i could just um say thank you to the many people um that have contributed to it both um within the directorate um claire darmy in particular has been taking a leading role um but but actually many many other uh, officers within the directorate but i was going to particularly thank um local authority partners as well who have been uh, contributing and as i say it's still a draft so very happy to continue to liaise uh, georgia you know with opcc and others uh, to get it absolutely in the right place before we finally go to print brilliant thank you thank you ed okay so uh, no more questions so uh, we can move on to the next item, Ed, whenever you're ready. OK, so the next item um, is a presentation. I, do forgive me that both of my items are back to back. Um, perhaps with hindsight, we might have split me up, so it's not all me speaking at the beginning. But uh, and, and do rest assured that there's plenty of other more interesting people coming up uh, later on in the in the board meeting agenda. Um, but uh, we, we shared um, with, with the um, agenda that went out, uh, a presentation um, which uh, explores a social innovation approach. And um, we have actually made some tweaks to that presentation. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen and uh, and talk you through it. Uh, so let me just see whether this is working. It says it's loading the presentation. Have people can people see that on their screens? Yeah, it's on the screen. Ed. Yeah. Great, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, so um, I think just by way of uh, introduction and background to this, um, I've framed this as from public service reform to social innovation. And I have shared this presentation in a couple of contexts um, already. And one of the uh, sort of critiques that has come is that um, in some respects, uh, it, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, public service reform isn't something that's necessarily bad and needs to be done away with, and instead we need to replace it with social innovation. Um, it's much more that we need to build on some of the ideas around social so public service reform into a wider understanding of social innovation. So I just want to say that at the outset, uh, and also to say that I share this um, presentation in the spirit of uh, again, dialogue, debate, discussion and thinking rather than here is a cast iron policy uh, that is now replacing some other policy is really not in that context um, at all. And um, in that regard, the first two slides um, are really about um, saying that uh, and I will come on to define and explain what I mean by social innovation in a few minutes time. But um, what I really want to do is to say at the beginning, we're already doing social innovation, both in our local agencies, uh, in the work, for example, that Gary's just described uh, through um, the fire service and through other partners, and indeed in the directorate as well. So there's a couple of examples that I've got here. Uh, one is um, the Housing First programme that's led through the Homelessness Task Force. Uh, and no doubt, uh, Jean and Neelam, who I think are on this call, uh, could say a lot more and be far more eloquent about this than than, than me. Um, but just to highlight a couple of the, uh, if you like, significant factors uh, around uh, what we might describe as a social innovation approach is that, uh, first of all, Housing First uh, looks at uh, if you like upstream problems, it looks at how you design out rough sleeping, how you design out um, uh, uh, you know, the, the problems that lead to people being homeless in the first place. And clearly having a home is one of those things. Uh, it's also um, in some respects a bit of an innovative pilot. Um, it was set up as a three year pilot across the seven local authority areas. Um, and it's had significant impact, 476. I think the number's a little bit higher now, have been supported uh, into housing through the programme, through £9.6 million worth of government funding. But another key element that I want to spell out here, which as you'll see is a key uh, aspect of social innovation, is that um, through the pilot, we are generating an evidence base, which then means we can discuss with government, as we are doing, uh, the possibility of scaling it up, of doing, uh, of, of, of really changing the way in which um, policy 
around homelessness is uh, is is developed. So um, that's an example of where, uh, in many respects, in fact, there's a lot more in terms of the homelessness task force that you could describe as uh, a systems approach, a social innovation approach, uh, as we are doing today. Um, in the wellbeing space, Thrive Into Work is another example. I'm not going to go through this one in detail, um, but very simply, um, we've um, undertaken a randomised control trial, trial working with um, 3,700 different people who have got mental health needs um, to look at a different way of supporting them into, uh, into work. So really, really tricky challenge, um, but delivered in a different way, not through your standard job centre plus route uh, with significant benefits and a 30% job conversion rate. So a different way of addressing a complex problem, an innovative approach, which now is at a point of scaling and spreading. Uh, so, so we're doing it already. A couple more examples of um, new projects that are coming along uh, where we're planning to take this social innovation approach even further. I'm not going to talk about the Net Zero Neighbourhood Demonstrator, um, but I will say a few words about the Coalition on Digital Inclusion, where um, what we've done there, uh, just as Councillor Singh talked earlier, through the pandemic, we've realised this is a bigger and bigger problem. Instead of trying to come up with a public service solution to it, um, what we've done is create a coalition of voluntary community business partners, um, and indeed some of the public agencies and local authorities that we work for. In fact, Wolverhampton and Birmingham uh, co-chair the coalition. Um, and what we've done is bring these people together in order to co-design a number of different projects uh, in order to address this issue. So we've got voluntary organisations working with local authorities to share good practice on how to distribute devices, for example, uh, whether that's through loan schemes or, or actually giving devices to families that need them. Uh, so there's a really strong learning dimension to, to what that's about. Uh, lots of good practice groups sharing information. And also we've used a lot of digital tools, which again is a characteristic of a social innovation approach. Um, and we've done some research and some mapping, uh, which again has helped us to begin to explore this really difficult issue. So we're still at an early stage with that piece of work. Um, but as I'll explain in a few minutes, um, understanding what is creating digital exclusion is a key first step before we start rushing into providing a new service or uh, or, or delivering something. Um, we've got to understand the problem first. So those are some um, examples just to kick off with to give us a, a kind of concrete flavour before I move into anything slightly more abstract. So a few words about public service reform. And um, I think before um, sort of Councillor Jones and others have, have suggested that perhaps we need to understand and describe what it is. So this is a bit of a characterisation, quite deliberately on my part, I'm characterising public service reform um, as being typically about the way in which government has talked about enhancing the productivity of public services. It's been very much about a focus on best value and performance management and how we control spending, whether that's in local government or police or schools um, and so on. Um, and I'm sure people on the call will be familiar with some of the sort of, um, if you like, processes that uh, have have um, been part of a public service reform approach, very often looking at how we manage risk, um, how we carry out audit on, on public money, uh, how we procure and so on, with um, clear ideas around floor, floor targets, ceilings and other kinds of target driven approaches. Um, and Again, very happy to debate this, but my sense is that kind of preoccupation, if you like, with public money um, has a, a preoccupation with ink inputs and outputs rather than um, outcomes and what we're trying to achieve overall uh, has really been counterproductive. And very often um, it's been undermined by the fact that uh, public service reform has been a bit of a byword for austerity. Uh, and so that's been quite um, tricky. Uh, and so that's that's been going on for sort of 10, 20 years. Um, and it's 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 where sort of the term public service reform in some circles has become quite controversial. Um, I think more recently there have been some really important attempts to uh, rescue public service reform um, during 2016, 17. And this is particularly important because this is when we uh, were doing our devolution deals as a combined authority with government. Uh, there were a number of commissions and other uh, pieces of work like the Barber Review where um, uh, 
uh, in many respects, public service reform took a, a big leap forward and became much more sophisticated and did talk about uh, whole systems approaches uh, and did go beyond just a narrow focus on public money. Um, but even there, I think there have been some problems, particularly as demand pressures have increased. Um, and I think, as we all know, in our local authorities, you know, further um, further cuts and uh, further challenges in, in relation to um, COVID most recently uh, and, and cuts in spending have made it incredibly difficult to find any room to manoeuvre in order to improve services. That's not to say that we haven't, um, but but too often that's been, um, it's taken a long time and it's been really, really difficult to um, achieve. So um, I guess what I'm saying, and this is uh, slightly for effect, and I will come back to this in a moment, is that a lot of the narrative around public service reform has been really quite contested and quite difficult. Uh, and so what I'd like to suggest um, is that actually the language of social innovation and the new thinking, if you like, that has come to the fore, particularly during the pandemic, uh, might be a helpful reframing um, of ideas um, of public service reform. Now, I want to be really, really clear um, that uh, I'm not sort of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And in a moment, I want to explain that public service reform is still, there are aspects of public service reform which are still fundamentally important. And certainly I want to be clear that social innovation isn't a replacement for public service reform, but public service reform has to sit, I think, within a wider understanding of social innovation. So what is it? Uh, well, I think first of all, it's a set of principles uh, which come together to form an approach. Uh, I will share a definition, um, but also I think it's important to flag that it's a set of tools which shape the way in which we work. And that's one of the areas that I'm particularly keen that we should focus on as a board is what are the tools that we need to use in our different uh, places, in our different uh, projects and programmes um, that will help us to better address the challenging problems that we've we've got. Uh, and how do we um, build on the successes that we've had and spread them uh, and scale them? So this next slide um, spells out some of those principles. And again, uh, it's a little bit for effect. And I really want to just re-emphasise the fact that um, social innovation, um, it's not an either or, even though this um, perhaps uh, presents it in that way. Uh, public service reform is absolutely a part of social innovation, but I just don't think it paints the whole picture. Social innovation normally tackles complex social needs and it does so particularly upstream so we look at the causes of the causes when we talk about health issues or um, we look at uh, how we design out problems uh, so that people don't even fall in the stream in the in the in the in the first place uh, that's very often a, a, a characteristic of, of social innovation as opposed to simply focusing downstream on the way in which we provide a public service at the point of delivery um, very often social innovation is an open and evolutionary process. I'm going to show you a diagram in a moment which explains some of that, that it requires um, at the beginning some really detailed exploration and understanding, uh, and then that tends to lead to processes of experimentation and then scaling and spreading. Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment, as opposed to just very, very targeted delivery focused service provision. Um, Social innovation very often enhances society's capacity to act. We talk about community empowerment, community engagement, uh, co-production, co-design. Um, these are some of the uh, ways in which actually, if we want to address these challenging issues, we need to bring communities with us. Indeed, we need to involve communities in designing the kind of solutions that uh, we need, as opposed to producing a service to someone or for, uh, for people. Very often it involves mobilising different types of asset, different types of resource. So we're not preoccupied with the public money that goes into a particular service. That's not to say that money isn't important and shouldn't be carefully scrutinised and audited. But we recognise the things like community centres. We recognise that things uh, like uh, people's own expertise and knowledge is really, really crucial if we're going to tackle some of these complex problems. And we also recognise that there will be different types of leadership. Uh, it's not all about, uh, forgive me, uh, councillors on the call, it's not all about the councillor championing it. We can also have business players involved. We can have voluntary sector leaders involved uh, and so on. And so um, it's good that if we've got public sector champions, but um, they're not necessarily the primary drivers of change. Sometimes we need to see cross-sectoral 
uh, working uh, with different partners all playing their role. And then finally, social innovation emphasizes creativity and innovation. Um, and we're really trying to experiment. Sometimes those experiments will go wrong uh, and that's fine, but it's very much uh, the emphasis is on, on creativity and innovation as opposed to managing risk and preventing anything untoward happening. Sometimes uh, there will need to be, need to sort of break a few eggs in order to make an omelette, I think is uh, the phrase that uh, we might want to use. So um, I'm going to skip through the next couple of slides, um, but these are some sort of principles in pictures and you've got the slide set so you can have a look at those. Um, we especially want to tackle the upstream um, issues. It's not to say that we're not concerned with secondary prevention or indeed with downstream service provision, but we really want to try and get upstream and we want to try and lead people away from the stream altogether. Here's the spiral that I talked about, the process of um, evolutionary change, uh, which begins perhaps with enabling, working, identifying needs, identifying opportunities and concerns, generating ideas, bringing system partners together before then we develop and test particular ideas and particular um, solutions. Uh, as we learn which ones work most effectively, we can then develop business cases and then start to deliver and implement particular services, which then, if they work well, we can grow and scale. And if I just skip on to the next slide, those examples that I talked about earlier on um, are now mapped onto this um, process of, of change. So coalition of digital inclusion is still very much at the early stage, bringing partners together, exploring what the problems are. Net Zero Neighbourhood and the Housing First programmes are where we've made a case now. We've looked at how it works um, and what we want to do now is to start to scale it and spread it. And when we think about the thriving to work, uh, stuff we've actually now started to scale that and what we really need to do is start changing the system uh, so that uh, we make sure that uh, there are better routes into work for people with mental health problems uh, in the kind of mainstream system rather than just in special projects. So that's a quick example of how this process uh, works. Uh, people might have seen this um, uh, ladder of participation um, where we consider the different ways in which we might involve communities in the work that we're doing from sort of educating them through to consultation engagement right through to actually involving them in co-producing, co-designing uh, and even actually owning and running assets um, themselves. Um, I'm going to skip over this slide because I don't want to take up too much time, but there's a great book by Hilary Cotton called Radical Help, which I think explains some of this in uh, very neat terms through lots and lots of great examples around youth services and health services and other services um, as well. So our definition um, of social innovation is how we change the way we work, our investments, our services, our products, so they support fairer, greener, healthier communities. It's all about how we change what we're doing. They involve um, individuals, communities, public agencies working really closely together, something that I think people have already flagged on the um, board meeting uh, today already. And they often involve addressing complex challenges by looking at their root causes and then reducing demand, reducing dependencies that can so often be very costly. So there's a, a suggested definition for you. If anybody says, so what is social innovation? It's about how we change the way we work, bring people together to address complex challenges by really um, reducing demand and reducing dependency on, on public services. And then um, again, I won't dwell on these uh, because they're in the slide sets, um, but they're just to say that there are a whole range of tools that we can use um, as we try to explore what social innovation might mean in any given context. So things like um, the, the uh, design thinking, uh, people might have come across this before, uh, a series of um, meetings that you can have uh, where you bring partners together to first discover what the problem is, then define it, develop new ideas and then start to explore and test solutions. So that's design thinking. Um, there's a particular way you can do all of that in 100 days, uh, 100 days challenge. Um, there's um, systems thinking as well, different types of system mapping. Some of you might have tried this uh, yourselves where you start to sort of draw and explore and break down problems uh, until you understand uh, precisely how they work and how you might change them. Again, lots of um, uh, great sort of tools that you can use to do that. And then people might have been involved in asset mapping, looking at a community, looking at a particular uh, if you like, system and saying who's involved where and 
who's got who who can change what and how's all that going to work together so there's a picture of people doing that in a kind of particular place-based approach there so lots of different tools that we can use and also we've got some partners that are really keen to work with us on some of this approach the young foundation and nesta um, are both um, very keen to explore um, how they might work uh, with our directorate also across the the west midlands and we've already kicked off an initiative with Corio and FutureGov, um, looking at um, how we create leaders of a social innovation um, approach. And again, some of your local authorities are already um, working with us on that particular leadership uh, program, which is fantastic to build our skills around how we do social innovation. This slide simply sets out um, some of the opportunities for collaboration that we might want to explore. This is by no means an exhaustive list. Uh, and it's just really, um, you know, just to flag different ways in which we might want to think about uh, or different topics where we might want to think about social innovation, whether that's um, using data in different ways, uh, improving early years support or adult social care, um, tackling domestic violence, um, or perhaps even developing more trauma informed approaches to our work. So there's lots of um, ideas there, uh, but I think one of the things that we're really keen to do is to talk to you, um, whether you're in a local authority or a different public agency, about could we work together in exploring what a social innovation approach um, might look like. And that brings me on to my uh, penultimate slide, which is really about an offer, if you like, um, to our partners to say we want to build our skills and capacity to do social innovation, we want to build on the successes that we've got already. We don't want to throw public service reform out. Um, we, we know that public agencies have got to change, um, but we think there are new ways of exploring that, whether that's through developing vision and strategy with you. We just started a conversation with Dudley about the possibility of doing some visioning work with them. That's a great example of that. Whether that's doing some research, trying to get under the skin of things, um, we can we can offer perhaps some of our resources, some of our services in doing that as well. Um, designing um, for change, um, trying to, if you like, just create a bit of capacity in a team uh, to actually explore things in a different way. Uh, again, I know so often that we're kind of nose to the, the grindstone in trying to deliver services. Can we come in and work with you to create a bit of capacity in order to explore doing things in a different way? And then perhaps prototyping, uh, doing these rapid results um, projects to actually try something new and then evaluate it and test it and see whether that actually works, understand its impact, or indeed perhaps just very simply facilitating or um, offering training around uh, some of these uh, issues that we might be most concerned with. So that's, if you like, an offer from our directorate uh, to our partners across the region to say, we'd like to work with you um, in some of these new ways. Uh, and then just Finally, in terms of what that might mean for our business model, at the moment we're very dependent on getting big grants from government in order to run programmes. That doesn't give us a lot of space to actually think about doing things creatively um, or more innovatively, and we end up on a bit of a cycle going down to London, um, begging for uh, more resource from government, and uh, as the picture suggests, the tail wagging the dog. Um, whereas I think if we move more towards the kind of model that we're describing, we use some of the fee funding to create this social innovation team within the directorate. And then really what we're trying to do is to bring government funding, grant funding, local resources, NHS resources and so on to the projects that we design together uh, so that uh, it's not about the combined authority getting money and delivering projects. It's actually about how we work together to draw the resource that we need to the particular um, ideas and approaches that we're trying to develop. So I'm going to stop presenting there and um, uh, open things up for any questions, uh, but I hope that's given a, a decent stab at uh, what we mean when we talk about uh, moving towards a social innovation approach. Thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, unfortunately, I'll have to keep my cameras off. Uh, I find it rude sometimes, but uh, my apologies for that. Um, so um, I'm happy to take questions uh, before I come in. Any questions from members? Gary. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And just one very quick one to just reiterate the point I made earlier. I was, uh, again, fully supported, Ed, and I, I think this represents a natural evolution of, uh, of PSR. It, it means more to you know to the community as well and you know is more engaging in the broadest sense i just wonder whether you know in tune with the sort of the wider 
community and sort of the, you know the macro picture there's a there's a an opportunity to feed the sustainability in there the overall broader sustainability i know you've got the references in your uh, or sort of economic growth and business from there but for me in the broadest sense it is around sustainability um, so just I'm, I'm sure you've considered this with the team but uh, for me they're on hand in glove in that uh, social innovation and sustainability so yeah but fully supportive of what you propose in there Ed. thank you thanks gary Thank you, Gary. Um, Laura. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Ed. Um, I, all of that is really interesting to listen to um, and, um, and makes perfect sense. I think um, for me, particularly everything you were saying there about this, this toolkit approach and, and particularly around collaboration I'm extremely supportive of um, and just on that on that note around opportunities for collaboration, I just wanted to share something that I think might might fit into into that thinking so um next week we'll be launching and i'll be co-chairing um a new um research and evaluation advisory group for the violence reduction unit it's very very small very focused but brings together um representatives from some of the West Midlands universities, but also academic experts um, and public health experts nationally as well in the small focus group. And well, we're working very closely with the Violence Reduction Unit. And of course, that links into the work that, that you and your team are doing. Um, and the, the remit of that advisory board is to, um, we're, we're kind of tasked as being a critical friend to the Violence Reduction Unit in terms of their evaluation and research activity, um, supporting the direction that some of that activity goes in, but also working collaboratively to think about what other funding we might be able to, to draw in from other sources for, for research activity, evaluation activity. So, um, so I guess I'm just throwing that out there to Brilliant. say, I think um, that's something that might not necessarily get out there into the, um, the existence of that board might not get out there into the public domain kind of uh, through the um, usual route. So I think it'd be really good if we could maybe mm. think about how that could all join together. Thank you. Councillor Singh, can I respond to that? Please, please. Simply simply to say um, that obviously evaluation and monitoring and research is very much part of a social innovation approach. Uh, so, you know, it'd be great to learn a little bit more about exactly what that group's going to do and how that might work. Uh, and again, uh, what we're trying to do here is to say that there are different resources around the region, if you see what I mean, that we can pull on together as we collectively uh, drive forward a social innovation approach. So if there's if there's work that we can do to learn from you and to uh, and to share in terms of that uh, research and evaluation, that would be absolutely great. I'd like to explore that. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Councillor Jones. Thanks. Um, it's good stuff. I, I like it. Um, if I'm honest, lots of it is stuff that I thought PSR was meant to be doing anyway. Um, so, so maybe this comes back to some of the, the lack of enthusiasm for PSR or just the misunderstanding about it because a huge amount of what you presented is kind of what I thought we were supposed to be doing anyway but it was in the new social inclusion column rather than the the already doing it column which, which surprised me quite a lot because they're, they're really good principles that I did think we were we were already meant to be working to um, and were already meant to be meant to be part of PSR. Um, pretty much everything you've said I'd recognise in, in stuff we're doing at BCC as well so, you know, we've got a major reform programme at the moment looking at, you know, various things that you presented here, like better prevention, uh, adults and children's social care, uh, more upstream help for people and so on. So very happy to share any learning from that. Um, and um, it's all good stuff to be doing that, that I you know we'd be happy to collaborate on. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you very much. Yes, that uh, input will be uh, valuable. You could share. Um, Jean, you're next. Thank you, and and um, thank you, Ed. And I, I, I suppose I wanted to echo a number of the points that Councillor Jones has just made, really, and also to kind of thank you for not pitting one against the other, because I think that that's the danger, really, that we kind of get uncomfortable with a particular term 
or we don't explore it enough and are clear enough about what collectively is meant by public service reform. And then we move to something else, which is sort of a means of achieving the same thing, but it's called something else. And then further down the road, we don't actually know what that means because we're not able to pin it down. So, so for me, again, I think the principles are absolutely there. And I see all of those principles in the collaborative work, certainly that we've been trying to do are, are in the Homelessness Task Force. The thing I, I wouldn't want to lose, and I think I mentioned it at the last PSR board, is that the Public Service Reform Board, it's a brave thing. It's a courageous thing to me because it is about acknowledging that public services, you know, are the universal space. They are that public realm and, and actually being prepared to own any changes that need to happen to them in order to make them more inclusive so that people are kept in public services and they are for everyone rather than they tumble out and they end up and we're picking them up. And the other point really was that around social innovation is, is very often seen as actually it's it's theirs, it's the communities, it's the voluntary sector, let them do it. And sometimes that can mean risk gets shunted into those sectors. Whereas what I like about public service reform as part of that, and clearly social innovation is important as well, is that actually it is owned. And there is a, a, a recognition there that collectively our public services, we really do want to make them fit for purpose for all, including the most vulnerable and, and inclusive. And I think there's loads of examples of that kind of work that's going on in this region really, really well. So thank you for that. No, thank you. And again, Councillor Singh, if I just might respond to um, Councillor Jones and, and, and Jean's comments, if I may. Please. Um, I mean, I think you're both absolutely right. Um, and I think to some extent I have characterise the difference between public service reform and social innovation for effect. And the reason I say that and the reason that we've done that is that I I don't think it's any surprise to people that um, I've, certainly in the time that I've been in this role, there's been quite significant criticism of public service reform with capital P, capital S, capital R, and the extent to which it's achieved anything and the extent to which it's just a byword for austerity. Um, and so to that extent, I think we've wanted to position this as a shift to something new and certainly a different narrative. Um, but you're quite right uh, on two grounds. First of all, yes, we are doing a lot of this already, but I think um, there's by being more explicit about it and clear about it, we're addressing the issue about, you know, what is it actually that we're talking about? So that's why now we've got a clear definition of what we mean by social innovation. And then secondly, that we certainly mustn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think I've said that three times now, um, that, that, that the public services absolutely have to change. And this is not an exercise in shunting the problem or the risk to the voluntary and community sector. And I think we're all very committed as public servants, many of us on this call, to actually being part of that change and seeing our services change. So um, if there's more that I need to do in our articulation, if you see what I mean, of of that, uh, of, of, of what we're doing, then, then I will seek to do that to make sure that we don't lose that point. Thank you. Thank you. At, uh... All right, if there are no more hands, I can come in here. OK, right. So, I mean, the name itself, public service reform, wherever you have this word reform, that there is bound to be some criticism because reform means change. And uh, if there is no criticism uh, for change, then uh, I'll, I'll be concerned that, you know, uh, uh, that, that there is no appetite for any reform. So change always come with criticism. So you're bound to have that uh, speculation and uh, criticism uh, about any change. But the key two words when we are trying to implement the change or when we are trying to uh, uh, reform things, the co key two words for me are co-production and co-design. And you have really accommodated both in your presentation as well. And that is the key. If you have co-production as a part of the change, if you are uh, co-designing with those stakeholders who are going to be uh, affected by the change or the reform, then the chances of these reforms are higher uh, to be successful. 
And we have achieved a lot in the past in terms of, uh, you know, uh, working with other partners like Homelessness Task Force. That was a, such a big success. We managed to uh, reduce rough sleeping by 65 percent in the last few years. And that's a huge achievement in terms of what we were trying to do through this board. Um, so we really need to build on to that. One thing I would like to see uh, in this report is a clear roadmap for engagement. Because as I said, the key is how we co-design and co-produce. So there needs to be a clear roadmap about how we're going to engage with the, our partner organizations, with the stakeholders, with the community organizations, and with the public organizations as well. And what are the platforms that we are going to use? What are the events we're going to organize? And what are those organizations? What are those target organizations we want on board? So there needs to be a, a, a bit more clarity about you know, how we are engaging and what are the organization we're targeting. Uh, but other than that, I think I think this is a really good initiative uh, at, and uh, I'm pleased that you know um, even uh, with this with this sort of uh, speculation in the beginning or this criticism in the beginning, we're trying to change things around, and we are bringing them on board about okay, if you don't like this, tell us what you want, come on board, share with us, co-design with us, co-produce with us, tell us how you want to, because this is the need of the time. You can't, uh, you know, uh, have a standardized uh, structure forever. You have to improvise, you have to adapt to the circumstances. And this is the demand, this is the need of the time. So we need to change, we need to reform how we do things, but how are we gonna do that? That's the key, that's the crucial bit. So, so if you wanna add anything, I'm happy to bring you in, Ad. Thank you for those comments. That's really, really helpful. Um, just specifically on your um, comments about how we engage and and that kind of thing. I, I think um, there is a there is a general answer about um, how, as a combined authority and a directorate, uh, we are considering our stakeholder engagement and and so on. Um, and also, we have been working again with partners um, to develop. Community an approach to community engagement that, uh, if you like, could be a kind of good practice guide that we could share with other people as well. So that's something that we've been doing. But I think um, my main response would be to say it kind of depends on the issues we want to work together on as to exactly what that co-design and co-production needs to look like and which partners we need to engage. And that's where, as I say, much of this is an invitation to local authorities um, and to our other partners to say, Come and tell us what you want us to work with you on, uh, and then we can develop together the kind of community engagement, co-production, co-design, um, you know, uh, activities that are best for that particular issue or that particular concern. Um, so, as I say, open door really to to to, to work together uh, on addressing some of the issues that you've you've just raised, Councillor Singh. No, that, that's absolutely. Uh, 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 the what i would expect is like open invitation rather than a, a sort of a restrictive framework about variable but so what's the next step from here at so we have uh we've agreed on you know how are we going to change things but what's the next step so are we going to uh sort of engage with the local authorities to start with or is it going to be open invitation for any organization how how do you going to move from forward from here yeah, so I mean, the open invitation starts here. So anybody around this board table who uh, wants to initiate a conversation, as I say, um, they happen actually um, a lot all the time. People get in touch and say, can we work on this together? But uh, I think we want to be clearer that that is an open invitation to people. So um, what uh, we're doing at the moment is going and meeting with um, colleagues in different local authorities um, and uh, partly the the new document that we've pulled we've pulled together is is a kind of again a conversation starter that we can go and meet and sit down and talk about what we've done historically and indeed this approach that we're offering if you like uh, mm -hmm. and then to work on particular projects together so um, as I say visits and and material to actually get those conversations going that's 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 certainly one thing we're doing the other thing that we're trying to do um, is to um, uh, 
develop the tools and the uh, facilitation techniques and the training uh, so that we've got a wider group of leaders across the region who are able to, uh, if you like, use some of these techniques. So uh, all the local authorities have invited, been invited to be part of this um, uh, civic program that we're developing and many have taken up that opportunity uh, working in partnership with Corio and uh, Future Gov so that's a, that's one opportunity that people are picking up on we're talking to the Young Foundation about other opportunities as well where we can basically build the skills and capacity of people across the region within our team but beyond that um, with others as well uh, so that uh, so that we can um, if you like learn together and one idea that we're exploring and again I think this needs to come back to this board is sort of creating some kind of social innovation units across the region not necessarily within the combined authority but more broadly across the region where as Councillor Jones suggested we can learn from the different experiences that are taking place in different local authorities and in other agencies uh, to if you like broaden that pool of expertise uh, mm. across the region so those are a number of the next steps that we're taking to, to, to widen the approach yeah, that, your last point, I think that's something uh, which I'm trying to allude to. That is something I'm particularly interested in, is to reaching out beyond this board because we can't restrict it to the membership because um, I think the number of stakeholders uh, which can contribute, who can contribute uh, to this uh, uh, agenda. And uh, what I would like to see is how we can reach out to those Sure. Uh, you know, at a, at a broad level rather than keeping it to the board level. OK, well, we can we can explore that in some more detail and come back with further further ideas as to how we do that. Some kind of virtual team or unit, as I say, I think is what we've been thinking about to date. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Ed. Um, so I've got next item is Mural Police and Crime Commissioner and WMCA collaboration. And I believe Claire, you presenting this. Yeah, that's me. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you hear me OK? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear, Claire. Brilliant. Thank you. So um, I think just a little bit of context around this. So both um, the Mayor and the Police and Crime Commissioner included a number of commitments in their manifestos pre-election around the types of work that they would want to do with one another. Um, and in the background, um, offices from the combined authority and from the police and crime commissioner's office have been understanding what those manifesto commitments mean in practice and how we turn them into a work plan and um, so this paper although very brief really just summarizes um that approach that we've taken and um, i think a couple of sort of quite important things just to note to start with um covid um uh, there's one report that describes covid as uh, effectively pouring rocket fuel on the criminal justice system that was struggling pre-covid so there's some significant challenges that the police and crime commissioner is very focused on addressing within the criminal justice work stream um, evidence tells us that the causes of crime and often the causes of the causes lie outside of the reach of the criminal justice system so tackling some of those wider determinants are um, key to both um, the combined authority and the police and crime commissioner and identifying those key areas um, has been uh, has been the foundation for this work going forwards the mayor, the PCC, um, the VRU uh, and the CA have quite a strong foundation of collaboration. So some of that work is, is within the public service reform uh, or social innovation space and some of it fits with the broader Transport for West Midlands activity around um, safer travel, for example. So there are a number of opportunities that we, we want to, to, to take forward. Um, and I think kind of just identifying some of those um, some of those complexities that lie outside of the, the criminal justice system, particularly around poverty, economic marginalisation, health, social care, some of the changes in funding around prevention and early intervention, particularly for young people. Um, those challenges are systemic and they're ongoing and arguably many of them have worsened as a result of the pandemic. So we know there's some big challenges here. Um, so I think th that was the, the foundation really for thinking differently around um, how we'll create or co-create a, a piece of work together. Um, the, uh, the mayor and the PCC still have to sign off on that plan. So the details of the work programme 
aren't published today uh, with the board papers, but I can speak through the types of areas that we're focusing on. The police and crime plan, and Georgie, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand that will be published for consultation in, in October um, and hopefully will be finalised and published shortly thereafter towards the end of October or beginning of November. And apologies, I've not got those timelines in front of me to share today. Um, so I think there's there's a couple of really key um, strategic um, agreements that both the mayor and the PCC will make, and that's working collaboratively to support some of the key regional governance structures, including the combined authority board and, and this board going forward. And, and in return, the combined authority will support things like the local criminal justice board and the plethora of forums that sit within that, including the, uh, the violence reduction unit um, and some of the community safety work streams. Um, both the Mayor and the PCC are committed to having a collaborative response to any critical incidents or any issues of concerns. And Gary, picking up on your comment earlier from the response through the Local Resilience Forum, and I'd be interested to see if there's any learning from that kind of civic leadership um, from those two key elected officials that we can wrap into that programme of work going forward. And then there are those policy areas where the mayor, the CA and the PCC have identified either work that we've been undertaking already and that will continue or new work programmes that were identified through the mayoral manifesto and the police and crime commissioners um, manifesto. So some of those areas of work include a real focus on the violence reduction unit. Um, so the combined authority lead and chair the sports partnership work. We are developing a trauma informed uh, coalition. Um, and those will overlap and, and will complement the work of the Violence Reduction Unit. Um, the Police and Crime Commissioner has uh, very kindly agreed to support a work stream within the Mental Health Commission, um, focusing on uh, mental health of people who are at risk of or involved in the criminal justice system. Um, and a similar comment would apply to our work on uh, race equalities. So in July, the Combined Authority Board approved the establishment of a race equalities task force, um, which adopts the um, the vision, and we're still in draft, but the vision that your ethnic background will be an asset and not a disadvantage to achieving a fair start, a decent job and a flourishing life in the West Midlands. And the PCC has agreed to lead a piece of work looking at race equalities within through the lens of the local criminal justice board to support that race equalities task force. There are a number of pieces of work that relate to uh, housing and homelessness that both the mayor and the PCC will uh, work in harmony together to understand how they can best support one another, um, both in terms of practical po policy changes and how they may be able to work with government and others to highlight the issues and needs uh, within the West Midlands. Um, colleagues may remember that we published a groundbreaking report, um, Punishing Abuse, which looked at childhood adversity. Um, so both the mayor and the PCC and the, the, the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner and the combined authority behind those will continue to develop those recommendations and take those forward. Um, the, uh, the mayor and the PCC both uh, put in their, mayor, in their manifestos are focusing on um, domestic abuse, hate crime and violence against women and girls. So again, within that broad plan of work, there are some shared actions um, and commitments around that. Um, and then um, some other um, pieces of work less relevant, I guess, to, to the work of this board, but just for information. Um, so thinking about having a shared approach to social value through procurement, thinking about police recruitment and how we um, use our colleagues in productivity and skills to make sure that we've got the same uh, level of diversity within the police force to that within the region and what we as a combined authority might be able to do to support that. Um, ditto in how we support ex-offenders with um, maybe some of the more flexible use of our ed adult education budget. Um, and then just a couple of final points really on how we think about um, and continue that work with our Safer Public Transport, um, which is a four party collaboration, um, including Transport for West Midlands um, as part of the combined authority and how we think about improving road travel. Um, so thinking about the number of people killed and seriously injured on the roads and how we reduce that, as well as wrapping in some of our greener travel um, uh, uh, um, ambitions. Um, and finally, and uh, probably um, the elephant in the room, um, thinking about how we communicate and collaborate on opportunities for devolution. 
Um, so at the moment, we are awaiting the review of the Police and Crime Commissioner's powers um, and both ourselves and the Police and Crime Commissioner's Office are keen to continue that conversation as and when we know more about what the direction of future travel is on that agenda. So, Councillor and, and Chair, I'll pause there if anybody has any questions or comments. Um, colleagues from the Police and Crime Commissioner are keen to come to our future board meeting to unpack some of that a little bit more as to what that means in terms of a, a, a full work plan and what some of the outcomes are from the work that we've done between now and then. Thank you, Claire. I, I really welcome that idea of uh, uh, PCC coming to this board because that's what I was going to uh, ask you uh, if we could arrange for them, which is fantastic. I think that's a really good opportunity for us to ask some questions directly and listen to the fantastic work they're proposing to do. Um, any questions from members here? No? Silence? Right. OK, I take it as a as a as a approval that this uh, is a positive step and everybody is happy uh, to see a bit more uh, detail about uh, what they're going to do and uh, look at how they're going to implement uh, the proposed steps. OK, thank you. Thumbs up from Gary. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Claire. So I'll move on to the next item, which is annual performance planning and uh, forward plan and uh, clear dummy again. Um, yeah, thank you, Chair. And I think we can do this relatively quickly. A uh, paper has been shared in advance. Um, back in March, the Combined Authority Board agreed um, to that the thematic board, so Public Service Reform and Inclusive Growth Board, would monitor our internal high level deliverables. So this is the things that we said we would do and our annual performance um, kind of management of those. So each of our high level deliverables um, are outlined um, in section two of the report um, detailing the aim and the progress that we've made on those since uh, since the last board meeting. Um, so you've got three months or so of activity reported within that progress. Um, there are a couple of areas where progress has slowed slightly, um, and that is predominantly as a result of um, uh, lack of capacity uh, within teams. We've got a couple of, of roles that we have um, either paused or been able to recruit to um, over the summer period. So that has just um, meant that we've had some capacity issues. Um, everything else has some uh, updates within the document. Um, and I know that you are hearing from more specific updates on our work on inclusive growth and uh, homelessness later on the agenda. Um, so I don't, unless there's any questions, I don't plan on going through the report line by line or, or item by item. Thank you, Claire. Uh, OK, I open it to the members for any questions here. Oh, OK. Um, I'd love to see, uh, uh, you know, uh, a bit more uh, feedback from the members here about if there are any any issues or any areas they want us to focus on. So please have a look at uh, the performance uh, report and the planning forward plan. But it is it is it is a draft plan, so it can be we can add if there is anything that you would like to see us focus on uh, moving forward. So thank you very much, Claire, for that. And uh, I'm happy to move on to the next item, which is Homelessness Task Force, which will be presented by fantastic Jean Templeton. Jean, over to you. It's going to be the fantastic Neelam that's presenting. Oh. Right. Okay. So and, uh, I'm, I'm here yeah. as well. Obviously, if there's any um, any questions or any issues that people want to talk to us about, thank you. I'll invite fantastic Neelam Sundar. To <laughs> thank you, Chair. Over to you. Okay. I've just got two slides, um, which I'm just going to bring up because I think they kind of illustrate the update that we wanted to present to board um, this afternoon. So hopefully, you should be able to see that now. So at the um, last meeting in July, we started to update the PSR board on the review that the task force had um, started work on with regards to the work of the task force in its first years. 
the progress that we've made and also our emerging priorities for the, the, the remainder part of this year, but also for 2022. Um, and all the kind of areas that we believe are kind of important and um, for us to focus on in partnership with our wider partners. We also took on board um, feedback from the board as well as the chair in that you would, as a board, like to see more information around um, the data that captures our achievements as a task force. So what we've tried to do in this slide here is really kind of hone in in the most crudest kind of way of the achievements and impact that the Homelessness Task Force has had in the first four years since its, since its inception in 2017. And, um, you know, I'm not going to go through through all of them. But what I've tried to show is some of that impact that we've had on the citizens and residents of the WMCA region, you know, be that through our Housing First pilot or our Rough Sleeping Initiative programme, you know, and also our alternative giving scheme change into action. We've also tried to show there the sort of um, funding that we've kind of worked collaboratively with our partners to kind of bring into the region and really add value to the work of our local authorities, our public services and also the voluntary sector. And, you know, just doing a rough totting up of that, you know, it's in excess of, you know, 15, 16 million pounds, which kind of shows, you know, that that kind of what, what we can do together when we work together for our citizens. And just at the end of that slide, what I've tried to show there as well is some of the more sort of policy, the more systems change um, impacts that we've had in terms of, you know, introducing a new regional definition on affordable accommodation, which we've brought to the board previously. Some of the work we've done around um, the initial freeze on local housing allowances, the work we've done with partners such as National Express West Midlands to ensure we've got travel to appointments for individuals in crisis and um, also around the commitment to collaborate work that we've done. So it, the last board I updated on our new toolkit. And of course, we'll, we'll continue to work with our key public and private partners in making that commitment to collaborate to design out homelessness with us. And um, for those of you who are eagle eyed, um, the, the information on this slide is also in the draft PSR um, brochure. But if anyone has any comments yeah. or any tweaks that need to be made to this, then obviously please do get in touch. And so what we've also done in sort of task force in part of our review is we held in one of our steering groups and um, some workshops where we talked about what it is we want to do, because we don't want to re rest on our laurels in terms of what we've already achieved. We want to do more. We've still got that grand ambition around designing out homelessness for the region. Yeah. Um, and so we, we we had a number of workshops in which we discussed kind of our next steps and our focus and what Jean and I and others have done over this last month is we've distilled kind of the learning and the discussion from the workshops into a really detailed work plan for this year and next. Um, and there's a whole host of kind of actions that we've we've put together in the work plan. But our activity is very wide ranging and it includes some of the points on this slide. So, you know, in terms of priorities, we've we've really thought about our Housing First pilot and how, whilst it's done a really good job across the region, we want to ensure that we secure long term funding from the existing from from the current spending review. We're also starting to look at and follow, you know, the removal of the twenty pound universal credit uplift and what that might mean and what the impacts that might have on homelessness in our region okay. and how to get how together we can lobby government around some of that impact. We also want to kind of build new partnerships with businesses, with employers using our existing business toolkit and also our alternative giving scheme change into action. The last year, you know, with the, with the pandemic, it's been difficult to engage yeah, with yeah. employers. You know, it's been a very tough time for them. But we do want to look at how we kind of re-engage and, okay. and continue that relationship that we've had with them previously. We're also through the Rough Sleeping Initiative funding that we've brought into the region this year. We're developing a website known as Street Support, which will be aimed at the public and residents um, at risk of homelessness to kind of ensure that they have good information around homelessness, you know, whether it's if they need help or whether they want to give help to really enable kind of good decision making. Mentioned 
just earlier on that we want to extend the commitment to collaborate. And now yeah. that we have got the commitment to collaborate toolkit, we want to encourage sectors, organisations and so forth to kind of pick that up and use it with us. You know, I've spoken previously in, in other updates around, you know, we started off in the homelessness task force focusing on rough sleeping. We've, you know, we've worked together. We've we've had a reduction in rough sleeping over the last two years, but we really now want to focus on that on broader homelessness and especially on prevention. So we're looking at, um, you know, work on children and families, which I've previously updated on um, and that we've got some particular task group around children and families that will really focus on families in TA and what that what that means and how, you know, how can we reduce our kind of need for children and families to go into temporary accommodation. We also want to now start looking at the links between domestic abuse and homelessness, and we're looking at setting up a subgroup of the children and families task group to take some of that work forwards. And at the last steering group, we also talked about um, people from abroad and those affected by no recourse to public funds. And again, we're kind of looking at how we might take that piece of work forward so we can really focus on it. And of course, we want to continue monitoring impacts of COVID-19, especially on rent arrears and evictions. And there's a lot more in our work plan, which I'm happy to share if anyone is interested. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. And of course, if you've got any questions, then G and I are here to take them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neelam. And you are doing uh, fantastic work and you are making difference to the lives of people in Senwell, uh, you and Jean, of course. Um, members, any questions for Neelam here? No. So you see, when, when, when you're doing a great job, when you're doing good work, nobody raised any questions to your work, which is good indeed. Yeah, yeah. Right. So thank you very much, uh, Neelam, for your presentation and thank you very much. Jean, carry on the good work. And Thank you, uh, I, I did mention about this uh, in uh, Labour Party annual conference. We had a, a few fringe meetings, and I did say that you know in in Sandwell or in in West Midland, we are doing, uh, you know, we are we are really making difference by working collaboratively with our other organisations to bring homelessness down. And this is a really focused approach that we are adopting, and it's working. So indeed, carry on the good work. Can I can I just say, uh, Chair, that that it's lovely um, to be <laughs> to be thanked. But actually, the point you made earlier about co-production and co-design and co-delivery, you know, all the things that we've we've been talking about earlier, that is absolutely what it's been about. You know, mm. we might be front facing it a lot of the time, but actually, you know, last week when we had the last steering group five o'clock on a Thursday night, still 30 people attending that steering group. Tonight, mm. the children and families group, and that's people from cross sector, cross region. They've made it happen, really. I think we're just there to kind of facilitate and, and bring people together. And the kind of things that Ed talked about around, you know, that that sort of, you know, bringing people together and, and focusing on what the issue is you collectively want to actually tackle. So, um, so we, we say a big thank you to everybody um, right across sectors um, for, for being able to focus on this issue with us. Absolutely. Please uh, pass on my thanks to everybody who supported you with this. Uh, yes, uh, and, and sometime, uh, you know, leading in terms of collaboration is a huge task in itself, really, you know, accommodating so many ideas, so many organisations onto one platform. That is a challenge in itself and you're doing great. So thank you very much for that. Carry on. Um, finally, we got uh, inclusive growth update from Claire Spencer. Claire, where are you? I'm here. I hope you Hi. can see me or at very least hear me. We can hear you. Mom. Loud and clear. Loud and clear. That's what I like to hear. OK, so I'm going to split my update into two halves. So just want to make sure that people who might be new to the board today can kind of conceptualise this. So inclusive growth work as we do it is split into two bits. So what I call 
um, dark matter. So this is about touching on what Councillor Singh alluded to before, which is to say, actually, we've got to try and deliver inclusive growth through everything that we do. So one of the really important things we have to work on as a team of two is to try and remake some of the processes that we make all of our decisions by to make sure that there's nothing that we do as a matter of habit that is inhibiting inclusive growth. So that's the dark matter side, kind of tweaking how we do decisions and policy. Then on the other half, we have the inclusive growth in the light, as I like to call it. And this is very much about saying, you know, it's all very well to have a load of tools and processes that help you do inclusive growth. But let's see how it works when you do it in real life, applied to real investments and real initiatives. And crucially, and this is the theme of today and hopefully every day in partnership with our local partners, because actually it's important that we stay as a team quite small and nimble and focus very much on that partnership piece. So I will take the dark matter side first. So one of our big focal points recently has been looking at our inclusive growth framework. Now, those of you who've been part of the Combined Authority for a little while will remember that that first came to Combined Authority Board in 2018. So it's been part of our policy for a while. It's basically the thing that says what good looks like, and it looks like a donut in its um, infographic form because we've very much drawn on donut economics by Kate Rayworth to work that up. But... What we found through using it, and particularly this is where we've done our partnership work with our local authority partners, is that it's been really helpful so far for kind of assessing our visions and checking our plans against. But what we haven't done so much of to date, um, see you soon, Councillor Jones. Um, what we haven't done so much of is using it in monitoring and evaluation. And we'd really like to change that because I know that's something that members are really, really keen to see. So we have embarked on a design sprint, which is just coming to its end. So we've worked with Solihull Council. We've been working with colleagues in the Black Country Consortium, as well as a few colleagues from around the combined authority to see what the donut can do as a way of measuring our progress as some, against some of these key elements of inclusive growth. And the agenda was a little too full this time around to bring it to you, but it's something that I think would be really helpful to bring to this board in a future time, because I think it's something that's quite interesting. And there's always that really thorny question of, do you measure the big stuff when you know that you can't do everything about it? So healthy life expectancy is a good example of this. We know as a combined authority that we are not the only game in town when it comes to how long people live. But we also know that there are some really important things that we can do. So it's important to measure the big stuff, but it's also important to know how much of an impact we can expect to have on it. So that's the work we've been doing on the inclusive growth framework. And hopefully, as I say, we can show you something on that. Oh, and just to say, as long as it's OK with you, Chair, if people have questions as I go along, please do interrupt because it's probably easier to, to deal with it as we go. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. I, I can't you. see any, any hands raised so far, so I'm no. here. Nor, nor I, but I'll, we'll both keep an eye out. Thank you. The next thing that we're doing is working with our IT team to try and decant some of the tools and processes we've collected around inclusive growth into a much simpler process. Because what we're really conscious of is that it can be absolutely mind boggling whether you are a developer, whether you are a regeneration lead in a council, whether you are a licensing officer, whether you are a social enterprise. There is a role that everybody plays in this inclusive growth picture, but it can be really hard to distill what your role should be and how you should go about it. So what we're trying to do, and again, this is about trying to add value to what is already there, is to bring this together in what, into what we're calling an inclusive growth portal. And it will give four options that people can go through around building strategy, around service design, around setting up um, commissioning and procurement and around investment. Um, no problem, Councillor Seckham. Um, and it's about trying to help people. OK, if I'm doing one of these four things, what are the steps I should go through to do inclusive growth in practice? And most importantly, who should I be working with to help me do this really well? So we're trying to decant some of that knowledge that we've not just us, but actually all the people trying to do inclusive growth have brought together to try and make that a little bit easier to work through. So again, hopefully we'll have something to bring to you on that really soon. Um, we've also been doing really well with our inclusive growth business partners network. So those of you who were here on the last couple of occasions will know 
that this is a cross organization network of officers who work in different parts of the combined authority in different parts of the system. So we've got people from the growth company, people from the LEP, people from the Black Country Consortium, people who inclusive growth might not be all of their job, but actually there is something they can do within their job to make inclusive growth reality. And we've been working really closely with them. And my colleague, Anna, who is listening in on this call, is a person who is shaping that network. Um, and so we've had some really interesting workshops recently trying to apply inclusive growth to kind of housing policy or to the business and tourism programme of the Commonwealth Games. So there's been a really interesting set of learnings there that has expanded out into a much wider network of officers. Um, and finally, on the dark matter, and again, this is something that should be coming around soon. We've been working on the single commissioning framework, which is the framework that our housing colleagues use in order to embed inclusive growth and other important things into housing investments that are made. So as we've been making those updates to the inclusive growth framework, we've also been trying to influence that to make sure those things stay aligned with each other. So I will pause there just in case anyone has any thoughts or wants to disentangle all of those words. Any thoughts, members, or any questions? Cool. Shall I quickly rattle through some of the in the light bits as well, go if that would be go helpful? For go for it, Claire. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so the most important bit, which you've had as a paper in the past, is the social economy growth programme. So I think when we last reported on this, we were just about to receive back the final versions of the things we were planning to do in order to grow the social economy and to double its size within 10 years. So that has all come back now. So we're in the process of putting that through our design process to turn that into a document that we can all both refer to and hold to account. And I'm currently in the process of reaching out across all the local authorities, across a number of our universities, across the LEPs and other partners to create a virtual team that will own that work um, so that we can make sure that all four elements of that are taken forward. And again, you know, this is not something that the combined authority either can or should do by itself. So if there's anybody out there in your organisations who you think, actually, yes, this is the person who needs to be involved in anything that's around social economy growth, please do put them in touch with me and I'll have a conversation with them about how they can be involved. Um, then with the work with local authority, so I'll start with with Sandwell. So um, Councillor Singh will know very well that Sandwell had its first meeting of its anchor institution network earlier this week. And one of the things we're obviously really keen to do with our inclusive growth work is to go with the grain of local leadership. So community wealth building and working with anchor institutions is a method that several of our local authorities are really, really keen on. So we are looking to support a couple of the subgroups to the Sandwell anchor network to make sure that we can back that local leadership in Sandwell. Um, in East Birmingham, I know Councillor Jones has had to leave us now, but we've been continuing to support the East Birmingham board. Um, so making sure that its delivery programme is focused on some of the things that it wants to achieve. But also Birmingham is currently making an application to become a living wage city. So this is kind of beyond being a living wage authority. It's about seeing if more of the city can sign up to this. And we've also been supporting that application to the Living Wage Foundation. Um, Finally, just very quickly on Solihull and Dudley. So with Solihull, we have worked, as you will all know, on the Kingshurst programme in particular for probably a couple of years now. And we have just come to what I think may be the last output of that piece of work, which is supporting the kind of co-design of a community involvement strategy to go with the Kingshurst regeneration programme. So we are working with Solihull now as to whether there's anything else that we can usefully do before we tie that up and let Solihull get on with their good work. So we're pretty pleased about that. And finally, with Dudley, and I know I don't know, I don't think Councillor Kettle is with us today, but I think one of the things we were really keen to do with Dudley is to explore where we could best add value. So. At the end of July, I spent a day with CoLab, who many of you will know as part of DoFest Dudley, to find out some of the things that local people were interested in, some of the interesting work that's already going on. And what I think we're hoping to do is to use some of the social economy growth programme to really support some of the plans for, for Dudley that are happening. So that's kind of where our thinking is at the moment. Um, and I will pause there for any questions or thoughts or comments. No, 
No questions, no comment. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, as uh, you mentioned in your verbal presentation or update, I call it, uh, again, this is again uh, something that we'll have to achieve collaboratively. We'll have to really include as many organizations into this effort to achieve what we want to achieve uh, in terms of inclusive growth, because this is such a wide uh, project, I put it this way, uh, and, and, and everybody can benefit from inclusive growth. And this is something which you really need to, uh, I think there's a lot we could do in terms of spreading that information about the benefits of inclusive growth, because I don't think it's, it's, it's very much clear about the benefits of inclusive growth. Yes, as a, as a whole, we all know that this is something positive. This is something uh, uh, which we need in, in, in the near future, which is, which is going to help the economy. But there are a wide range of benefits from inclusive growth, and we need to really get as many businesses on, on board to share the information forward and to inform residents and the businesses and everybody who, who could support us in terms of uh, inclusive growth. So thank you very much for your update. Carry on the great work, as I say. OK, I've got uh, one little any other business. Uh, I haven't received any anything uh, from from uh, anybody, but there are two things I'm not pleased about today. One is my camera was not working, so I know this meeting is going to go on YouTube and I'm going to miss out on that visual presence, which I would have loved to have, unfortunately. But never mind. The second thing I'm not very pleased about is the attendance. Um, I think what we're trying to achieve from this board is, is that, you know, we want to bring everybody on board, which is important. And when we don't have enough attendance of the board members, how are we going to encourage other people to come and join us? So I would love to hear or get any ideas about how we can uh, increase attendance moving forward, how we can encourage members to participate more and contribute more. I am very much tied up with there's a lot going on in Sandwell. Sandwell is a vibrant place uh, and I have to admit it that, you know, it, it keeps me busy seven days, but I would love other members to help me with this, how we can increase attendance, how we can uh, really spread the word that we are trying to achieve something positive through this platform. And let's get uh, together to deliver what we are trying to. Um, I've got one hand up, Gary. I'll bring you in here. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And specifically in, re in relation to that and the request for, for the support for the group, um, I'm uh, uh, intending to bring a, a colleague along to the next meeting if it's acceptable by uh, yourself and the rest of the team because we've uh, we've created a dedicated sustainability and innovation post we're leading a project so I think they could be a real sort of key facilitator and enabler for this group and could really support some of the uh, some of the things that have been done there so uh, it's a colleague called Neil Griffiths so I'll, uh, I'll include him in the correspondence. And also in support of my sort of contributions earlier to both uh, Ed and in response to the question asked by Claire, um, I've reached out to another one of my colleagues, Deputy Chief Officer Wayne Brown, who is the chair of the Local Resilience Forum, and he's agreed to come and present the uh, the sort of the learning from the debrief and the outcomes at the next meeting. So uh, if that can be placed on the agenda, um, yeah, he's uh, Wayne will happily come along and present that, and uh, maybe that'll be a you know a feed into some of the other elements. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Gary. Yes, absolutely. You're more than welcome to uh, bring uh, more members on board and any contributions will be appreciated. Uh, can I also extend this uh, invitation to all members? So please, if there are anybody who you think can contribute uh, uh, by being present on this board, you're more than welcome to bring them on. Just let Ed know uh, who's coming and uh, uh, I'm sure there is no issue with sharing the information with members who are not on the board uh, so that they come prepared and they have their contributions ready as well. OK, uh, if there are no more comments or questions, I'm happy to 
close this meeting. But before that, uh, uh, I think uh, we have agreed the date for the future meeting, but we haven't. Uh, so had, have we have we got a date for the next meeting? Yes, I'm just looking it up and it is the 7th of December. 7th of December, right. OK, that's going to be a busy month. Um, so we have, we're not sure whether we're going to have a virtual meeting or in person, because if there is anything uh, that we need to agree on, then we'll have to have a meeting in person. But we'll let you know well in advance how, what the format of the meeting is going to be. But please keep that uh, date in your diaries, please. Um, I think we had a really good meeting and we're well in time. We got 10-15 uh, minutes, so you can do whatever you want in those 10-15 minutes left. Uh, can I thank Ed and Claire and everybody who contributed today uh, for your contributions and uh, for uh, for such a productive meeting. And I look forward to see you all soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Singh. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. See you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.